Hi, welcome to Spirit Production in the course of Spirits and Mixology Management, CUL 4045. This is going to be a recorded lecture uh, that hopefully will help you understand the reading at greater detail. And it's all about spirit production. And it's going to bounce around uh, through many components of alcoholic beverage, but hopefully it will form the foundation of understanding as we move forward each week from here where we will be more specific, uh, focused on a, a particular category of spirit each week. This will give you the foundation of how we made it a spirit. So on this slide you see some awesome shots of bars in various locations. And uh, the foreground, may you may be able to see some fabulous glasses filled with beautiful drinks. And just take it in, absorb it for a second. Imagine yourself at the bar, if you will. Um, bear in mind, behind you on the back shelf of each bar are an outrageous selection of spirits, liqueurs. Perhaps in the coolers, there are other beverages that we sell the customer. So just take a moment, think about that. On this slide, I'd like you to sort of, on a piece of paper, write down what categories of items would be on the menu of those bars we saw. So if you want to pause, you can do that. Um, you can break the categories down in numerous ways. You could keep them broad or you can get them narrow. Uh, I'm not asking for brands, just sort of what are the categories of things that we would sell at those bar uh, from the beverage side, if you will. All right, so you can pause and write your notes. <clears throat> and then when you unpause, move to the next slide. So the first way I might break down what we sell, uh, it, it could be non-alcoholic drinks versus alcoholic drinks. Uh, this course is not really going to focus on non-alcoholic, so um, you can take that in one of our other classes. I think it's CUL 3093. And um, that class would focus on water, coffee, tea, soda, or carbonated beverages, juices, mocktails, and I'm sure even more. We are going to focus on the alcoholic side. And although uh, our class focuses more on spirits and liqueurs, we have to realize the bartender should have an intense knowledge of the beers, uh, meads or honey-based fermented beverages, ciders, sakis, wines, spirits, and liqueurs that are sold at that bar. So to get us started, we really want to sort of identify, to have an alcoholic drink, where do we get the alcohol from? <laughs> it doesn't just show up, right? So we have to break that down. When consider getting alcohol into a, a liquid, um, the first consideration is the process called fermentation. You may have covered this in other classes, but we'll try and give you a refresher. I know the list of alcoholic drinks there um, are made up of both fermented and the next step but uh, called distilled um, spirits. And the, the course itself is focused more about spirits and liqueurs. I think it's important that we know how to get to spirits and liqueurs by understanding that we had to start with a fermented beverage like a beer, cider, or a wine. So here is the fermentation formula in its simplest form. Um, and it basically says that fermentation is when yeast metabolizes sugar. So the yeast eats the sugar. And as byproduct, it gives us three things. It gives us ethanol, which is a type of alcohol we get from fermentation. It gives us carbon dioxide, which we can release into the air, or, in the example of a sparkling wine, trap it. And, of course, because it's a chemical reaction, there is some heat development. This is the basic fermentation formula. Uh, you could just write it S plus Y equals E, comma, CD, or CO2, comma, H for heat. Um, you should have that memorized. It's kind of important. So you have to keep in mind that the fermented beverages can be made from many different sources. Um, so we're going to show those to you. The source, of course, imp impacts character, flavor, aroma, maybe the amount of alcohol that can be made. Each different source ingredient might have a different quantity of sugar available for the yeast to eat. These are things to consider. So, some of the sources you might be familiar with. Grapes, of course. Pears. Apples. Any fruit really has sugar available to it that can then be fermented. 
Um, if we're down in the Caribbean or in a more tropical zone, you might identify with sugarcane and of course locally honey. Items that don't necessarily have sugar immediately available, but they have starch that can be converted into sugar might be the whole character uh, or whole category called grains. So this would be, hmm, I think this is wheat. Then we have corn, oats, um, rye, and then a sort of a vegetable. And there are a bunch of vegetables that either produce a high level of starch like potatoes um, or sugar beets that then can be converted into sugar. And this picture, of course, is the piña or they call it a pineapple, but it's actually the top head of the agave plant from which we make tequila. So I'm going to put a line between the left side of the photo and the right side of the photo because the left side, the sugar is available for fermentation. It can be quickly mashed, crushed, juices extracted, and then fermented. However, the right side requires an additional step. We have to convert the starch to sugar before we can even get to fermentation. So it's important to recognize that fruits and honey and sugar cane a little more accessible at making a fermentation while grains and vegetables that are high in starch need that extra step. I didn't type it on the slide but that step is called saccharification. It is in your reading so please take note of it. So take a class, last look of all these products, move to this photo and consider that all the bottles behind this bartender are basically representations of different source ingredients with different processes. Either they've been, for, well, they've all been fermented because they all have alcohol in them, and then some have been distilled, some are just left fermented like a wine or beer. But the thing that makes them unique is not only the source ingredient, but the process. And uh, we'll hope to get into that a little deeper. Also looks like a nice place to work, eh? So, breaking down a fermented beverage, what's in it? Um, my diagram here highlights that it's mostly water. Um, and then there's, of course, the ethanol component. That's the alcohol we're looking for. And then a small amount of something called other compounds. So what are other compounds? Uh, your book highlights the term congener. And then there's acids, aldehydes, and esters. Esters are often associated with aroma, while congeners are associated with flavor. These are developed, all of these elements are developed during fermentation. And then on the alcohol side, you're all familiar with ethanol, but there are other alcohols in there. So methanol and fusel oils, both of these are often associated as the components that can impact how much of a hangover we may experience when having an alcoholic beverage. So keep this in mind, because uh, we're starting, in order to distill, we've got to start with a fermented beverage. So you have to know what's in your fermented beverage. Water, ethanol, other compounds. So let's turn our beer or wine into whiskey or brandy. To ferment, or the reason we ferment is to create alcohol. We distill because we want to raise the bar. So once we've completed a fermentation, we've made wine, um, a distiller's beer, or sometimes called a wash, now we go to the next step and we can create the spirit categories you may be familiar with such as brandy vodka whiskey etc so what is distillation simply say, stated it's a process that will concentrate and separate elements from the original solution this is a picture of a cool old still so distillation separates and concentrates. So that this is our whole fermented beverage, the water, ethanol, and other compounds. If we simply apply some heat, we will find that the ethanol can be released or separated, and then we can concentrate that to make the beverage we want. Notice in the fermented beverage, our alcohol level was about four to 14%, but when we remove it from solution, that um, alcohol by volume level, that is what an ABV is, increases because we have separated it and concentrated it. How is this possible? I mean, we've been doing this, some people say, for 2,000 years. Um, there's, there are historical references to clay stills created back in China and in the Middle East. 
but um, <clears throat> let's break it down in a simple uh, process. The key is to recognize our two components, water and ethanol, have different boiling points, meaning the point that they will turn into a vapor. Now, to be confusing, sorry about that, the point that they turn into a vapor is does not mean they are not evaporating at a lower temperature. I'll try and see if I can clarify that for you later. So, the boiling point for water, anyone? I think you should know this. In Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit it's 212 degrees. In Celsius, it's 100 degrees Celsius. So, water will turn into a vapor at 212. It'll start to evaporate at room temperature, but how much and how fast it does increases as it gets warmer. Ethanol will evaporate or vaporize at 173 Fahrenheit or 78 Celsius. You should know these numbers for testing purposes. So because ethanol is a lower boiling point, it will come off of the heated solution before the water. And of course, that allows us to separate it. Pretty cool. So all of our spirit and liqueur bottles, as well as our wine and beer, have a measured alcohol strength on them. In the EU, they typically use the term alcohol by volume, and it is in the form of a percent. So you may see on a bottle of scotch, ABV 40%, they often abbreviate. Down below in the United States, we came up with, with a method called proof. Somewhere in the uh, 1700s or 1800s, someone was trying to establish how much or how strong the alcohol was. So they mixed the alcohol with gunpowder, sounds like fun, and lit it on fire. If it burned an even strong blue flame, it was called gunpowder proof. So the word proof stuck, and our number, the number 80 in this reference, refers to twice the amount of ABV. So proof is always double ABV. You can take a look at the Everclear label, which I suggest you never purchase. It is 95% ABV or 190 proof. So the top of the measurement scale would be 100% ABV or 200 proof. Ooh, sounds dangerous. When we distill, we have a choice of a variety of equipment. On the top left, you have the classic pot still, which is an individual single batch at a time kind of work. Uh, soon after that developed, or probably not soon, more like a thousand to fifteen hundred years later, the coffee still was invented, so technology raised the game. Um, the coffee still is named after Mr. Coffee, and um, it's a single column that allows us to continuously separate and concentrate our alcohol. As technology moved forward, we have the multi-column still, which is what you see for the large production type facilities. And then um, as boutique, brew, uh, boutique distillation or artisanal distillation evolved, you have these hybrid stills, which sort of combine a bit of the pot action as well as column action. Pretty crazy cool. Each one has their own advantage and challenges. So just for the basics, the pot still is a little drawing. I think you have a, uh, a handout that shows this, but does not have the written information. It's important to recognize that a pot still is a single batch. So if you look at the left side, the sort of rounded container, that would be our pot. And let's say that held like 200 gallons of fermented beverage. So we put 200 gallons of wine in there. And underneath, in the sort of bricked uh, area, is a heating element. It could be with coal, it could be oil, gas, wood, dependingly. But you would heat the pot, and as the pot warms, at a, you know, somewhere between 100 and 173 degrees, we have ethanol creeping up the neck, and then working down to the far right-hand device, where you see the zigzagging pipes. And I tried to color them to identify that there's a water solution, a cold water solution around it. So a, a liquid will turn to a gas when it's heated, and then a gas will turn back to a liquid when it's cool. Sorry to bring back high school science. I hope that wasn't too painful. So key parts about the batch process, um, it, it creates a lower maximum alcohol concentration. So between 55 and 70 ABV. So 
the strongest batch we could make would be 140 proof. And because of this, this is a less pure resulting distillate. Therefore, there are more congeners, and that equals greater character in the finished spirit. This is well suited to certain spirit categories, like scotch, whiskey, um, certain rums. So we'll cover that as we ca you know, tackle each category each week. The negative side, this is very time consuming. You can do one batch at a time, then you have to clean it out, reset the machine, and that of course equals expense. Some unique variables to pot stills. The resulting spirit that they make can be influenced greatly by these four components. Materials, shape and size of the still, the reflux, and the speed of the distillation process. So in regards to materials, copper is the leading metal, both for its heat and for its chemical interaction with the vapors of ethanol as they are being distilled. The picture at the bottom highlights a couple stills at a large manufacturer next to each other, and you'll notice they're not the same size. So size can impact the quality of distillate that is extracted. Reflex is a term of, I mean, I'm sure you've all boiled water with a, pot, a top on top of a pot, and you can always see how when the steam hits the top of the pot, it turns back into water and forms condense, uh, condensed water droplets. Well, this is the same concept. As vapors work up the neck of the still, if the angle is such that it is pointed upward, those vapors can easily go to the next step. But if the angle is level or tilted down, um, it changes the flow of vapors. And this results in different qualities or heavinesses of distillate. The last part is speed and it suggests that if you're doing a quick or fast distillation you're not going to separate and isolate um, as much character you're going to or you're actually it's going to be so fast that more cogeners will carry over where if you do it slower you're, you're going to lead to a more of a pure type spirit. So we're going to leave the pot still and move over to the next style of still. That's called the column still. I think you also have a graphic of this. This has one really powerful advantage of being a continuous process. So as new fermented liquid is added, finished distilled spirits coming out the other end and it is very, very efficient. It also, you can see that there's all so many levels here that it really does a super job at separating and concentrating the spirit, the spirit that's finished. This means that your resulting spirit is gonna be high in alcohol, you'll notice the numbers, 90 to 96 ABV. So we're at 180 to 193 proof. And because we're at that higher alcohol concentration, the purity, uh, the, there's not gonna be cogeners, it's gonna be very straight, clean ethanol um, so besides high strength, we also get high purity. In the mouth or in the tasting process, we would call this very neutral in flavor, low in cogeners. There's a cool little um, online illustration on how this works. If you're feeling geeky, just go to that YouTube site and take a look, or you can go to YouTube and type in distillation basics, how a distillation column works. So, we know that distillation is about pulling the ethanol out, but what changes the true character of one spirit to another has a lot to do with the other compounds and how we isolate certain congeners and other components. So it's important to first recognize that congeners are really key to flavor and aroma. And these uh, compounds are known as acids, aldehydes, esters, fusel oils, and other alcohols. So while we're separating, we pull the ethanol away and we hope to, I mean, this is the skill of the distiller speaking, to isolate, you know, the best product for the style of spirit we're trying to make. So based on that, if we were making a rum, we might have one set of goals versus making a bourbon where we'd have a different set of goals. 
while the spirit is distilling and uh, it turns into a vapor and then it gets recondensed to a liquid the first batch of liquid that comes off of the still is called the heads another name for it is four shots these come off first because they boil at lower temperatures or they turn into a gas at a lower temperature thus they're called low boilers the best part of the distillation that we want to keep is called the heart we call this the potable spirit it's drinkable i mean as far as spirits are drinkable and it has the key flavors that we're looking for the third part is called the tails or faints these boil at a higher temperature and therefore are the last part to come off the still now the real skill for a someone who is a distiller is to know how to cut and separate the heart from the heads and tails. So, a good distiller uses experience, science, and a little bit of art to separate the best potable spirit that we call the heart. This is what's gonna continue forward into our finished distilled spirit. The heads and tails may be reused or applied to another batch, or if they're of low quality, they'll be discarded. So in a sense, what we've covered so far is how the spirit's made. Next step, maturing the spirit, mellowing it, and getting it ready for market. So the liquid that comes off the still is as clear as water. This is what it looks like. Um, the question is, is it ready to drink? There's a name for this. It's called new make spirit. Um, it is harsh. Uh, it's not colored. Uh, it has no smoothness. It's intense. So, there are post-distillation processes that will be applied based on the style of spirit you're making so that we can have the result that we are looking for. If you have a short process or long process, it really depends on the type of spirit you're making. In the shorter style, the new make spirit can be placed in a stainless steel container, a large cask, and uh, just it can be rested so it has time to sort of evolve and fine tune. Uh, these spirits can be filtered, that's what the, bottom, uh, the machine at the bottom of the slide is. They can be colored, literally by adding caramel, food coloring in some cases, and then sometimes sitting in an oak barrel they can achieve color. And they may be blended with other like spirits to achieve a certain flavor or character. When they're all ready to be bottled, uh, we have to establish a bottling strength. So new make spirit would be cut with demineralized water so that you would achieve the proper ABV for bottle strength. And most of us, if you look at the bar, when you're working at the bar and you look at your bottles, you'll find most spirit bottles are about 80 proof or 40% alcohol in regards to bottle strength. Something to pay attention to. On the longer process, you have aging in oak. Spirits or new, ma new make spirit is placed in barrels because something magical is gonna happen in those barrels. It's important to know that barrels um, have a certain composition. Uh, they're made from cellulose, humus, hemicellulose, linen, and tannin. All these elements play a role in impacting our spirit. Uh, barrels come from the Quercus alba, also known as the American white oak. It's chosen a, because it's pretty available in the United States, but on the production side, it's a strong wood. Um, the wood resists impact by insects and fungus. And when it's formed into a barrel, it's pretty watertight. By putting a new make spirit into a barrel, we're hoping some things are going to happen. Uh, our goal is that color and flavor will definitely be impacted. We hope to, to mellow the alcohol's harshness. So its interaction with wood will help it take some of the harsh characters away and create a smooth beverage. We also want to remove some of the impurities of the spirit. In regards to meeting legal requirements, I think um, the thought is, in, in some cases, through evaporation, you, lo you lower your alcohol um, level and therefore achieve the appropriate selling point for alcohol level. The amount of spirit that does evaporate from the barrel is often called the angel's share. So barrels don't just fall off trees, as I'm sure you're aware. It's not a giant pine cone that we've hollowed out. But um, it is a particular craft. So in the United States, this craft of barrel making is called coopering. 
So in both photos you can see different stages of the coopering process. And a completed barrel is really a mixture of a bunch of boards held together by rings and then they cap them at each end. Uh, you can see in one scene there's a little bit of warming to the inside of the barrel because the barrels are typically charred. Speaking of charring, the charring process is essential for our spirit development because it changes the chemistry and character of the inside of that barrel. That oak aging process that our spirit's going to go through has six different impacts that we really want to know. So here are the six, the first one being extraction, the second one being evaporation, third one oxidation, fourth concentration, fifth filtration, and sixth coloration. You want to be able to be able to discuss these or describe these when asked in class or on a test. So let's take a look. So the oak aging process in regards to extraction, as the spirit sits in there, it's going to have an interaction with the wood that has been toasted or charred and that is going to make these flavors available to the spirit. And the spirit will absorb oakiness, sweetness, um, toasty characters, vanilla, almonds. It's amazing what it can pull from the actual barrel. While we do our tastings and our sensory analysis, I'll look to see what you can find as you taste these. The oak aging process in regards to filtration, you can see a picture here of different char levels that the coopers have done. If we were to tilt these on the side, you would notice the char doesn't go all the way through the wood. But as a new make spirit sits in the barrel and the seasons warm the barrel and cool the barrel, the liquid, new make spirit, works its way through that charcoal level and back into the barrel, creating a sort of filtering aspect. This smooths our spirit, makes it less harsh, and removes impurities. As the barrels sit with new make spirit in them, evaporation is going to occur. Evaporation can occur in two ways. Water can evaporate and alcohol can evaporate. Alcohol, of course, or ethanol, evaporates at a cooler temperature than water. But it all really depends on where the barrels are. Are they in a warm climate or are they in a cool climate? As well, how much humidity? So if there is a humid climate, it's more likely that alcohol will evaporate first. If it's a dry climate, you're going to have more water evaporation. Either way, the product that's lost is called the angel's share. On an annual basis, we believe it takes about, uh, about 3% of the barrel's production disappears each year that the new make spirit is in the barrel. Another consideration might be that aging happens faster in the barrel when you're in a warm climate as opposed to a cool climate. So if I'm aging rum in the Caribbean in an oak barrel, it's going to age much quicker as compared to a scotch up in Scotland. You'll hear that again, but just starting off some good information. So oak aging process oxidation. I'm cheating here. I stole a picture of a sherry um, barrel because you can actually see inside. But I think it'd be very similar to what a whiskey barrel or a spirit barrel would look like. So oxidation is uh, oxygen itself is seeping in through the walls of the barrel and interacting with the spirit inside the barrel. And if you can imagine when you cut open an apple at your kitchen counter and left it out and you see it turn brown, you can visually see oxygen oxidation occurring. The same concept is occurring inside the barrel. So this impacts the flavors and the aromas of the spirit and we have new chemistry that results in some really cool flavors. In addition to oxidation, because we have evaporation, the flavors that are inside the barrel will also concentrate. So they'll get stronger and more intense. This is another benefit of oak aging. It makes good sense to recognize that when a spirit comes off the still, it's absolutely clear like water. So the, of course you can add color, uh, through caramel and other instances depending on the rules of the spirit but the best way or the classic way of gaining color is through barrel aging. So the tannin inside the barrel when toasted creates something called the red layer. This red layer will create color for our spirit. 
Of course, oxygen also supports coloration because as a spirit or wine or beer are exposed to air, the longer they're exposed, the darker the, the spirit will get. Here's a snapshot from a tour at Jack Daniels in uh, Lynchville, Tennessee. And you can see when the spirit comes off the still at zero years old, it's absolutely clear. And after sitting in an oak barrel for two years, this is a brand new oak barrel, it gains that much color. And if you compare two year to four year, it doesn't seem like it's much darker, but apparently the folks in Jack Daniels think something magical happens between two and four years because uh, even though they're not gaining color, they're probably gaining other components that make their spirit so tasty. So the last part of today's lecture is just understanding spirit categories. Um, you may know them. I, I think you'll be familiar with them. And um, the course from here forward basically tackles uh, one or one and a half categories per week. And you really specialize in what makes the components of each category distinct. And then what are all the subsets of each category? And of course, then we get to taste them in class. Woohoo! So let's take a look at some spirit categories for spirits and liqueurs. So it all, I think one of the best ways to identify it is, you know, where is, what is the source of that beverage? So again, on the left, let me see if my, I've got, I think wheat, then below that I've got barley, I've got potatoes, sugarcane, grapes, pears, I've got the agave, I've got oat on the bottom, raspberry, and then rye and corn. So if we take these base ingredients and magically ferment and distill them, ta-da, you have these spirits. On the back on the left side, you have blended whiskey with the malted barley of scotch whiskey. Um, of course, vodka can be made from any grain, but a lot of people associate um, the Polish method of making vodka from potatoes. Um, rum is classically made from sugar cane. Brandy and grappa come from grapes. Um, Irish whiskey often has a certain portion of oat in it. When you make a brandy from a fruit other than grapes, we often use the word eau de vie, which literally translates to eau, oh, sorry, water of life. At the top there, you have the agave, which is a source of all tequila. And then corn is a major component in the recipe to make bourbon. Rye, it would be a major component for making rye whiskey. And again, I show you some more fruit there as another example of eau de vie. So here are your spirit categories. I believe next week we go into brandy and fruit-based spirits. But um, notice the pink box at the bottom right. That, of course, is not a spirit. It is a wine, but it's important in regards to the making of quality cocktails. So that's why we popped it on there. Thanks again for your time. I hope this is helpful. I'm sorry the snow day got in the way, and I look forward to seeing you in class next week.